Good morning everyone and welcome to today's WorkSafe Month webinar, Developing a Simple WHS Management System. I'm Stephanie from WorkSafe Tasmania and also the coordinator of WorkSafe Tasmania Month. I'll also be uh, the moderator for this morning's uh, session. Before we do get started, I'd appreciate you just taking a few moments to look at the following uh, slide, which provides you with information um, that is delivered during WorkSafe Month sessions. I'll now run over a few items so that you know how you can participate in this morning's webinar. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something like this um, that looks on your computer screen in the upper right hand corner. You're likely listening into your computers, um, listening, sorry, into your, using your computer's uh, default um, speaker system. However, if you'd prefer to listen over the telephone, um, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing in your questions into the pane on the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the webinar and uh, also at the end of the presentation. We are recording this morning's webinar and we'll progressively make any webinars that we do run during WorkSafe Month available um, at the end of WorkSafe Month on the WorkSafe Tasmania website. Lastly, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we appreciate if you would complete that survey and provide us with your feedback and comments. I would now like to introduce to you today's presenter, Craig Hortle from the Tasmanian Chamber of Commerce and Industry to present this morning's webinar, Developing a Simple WHS Management System. Welcome Craig. Well, welcome along everyone. It's really nice that you've made the time to uh, take part in today's webinar. Just a, a little bit of my background, I've been working at the TCCI for a, uh, a couple of years now as a workplace health and safety advisor. I come from a trade background and uh, I've worked in, in various uh, larger industries, been involved with workplace health and safety in those businesses for a number of years and also been involved in the training area as well. Just a little bit of information about today's webinar, really trying to work out who this is for. So primarily I sort of developed the, the webinar for people who might be in small business, who may be sole traders, might be in a partnership, whatever it might be because the complexity of a workplace health and safety management system uh, diminishes a little bit the smaller the business that's, that's taking part in it. But also if you're listening in from a larger business, there might be some aspects of, of what we discussed today that you might be able to apply in larger businesses as well that um, can help you simplify what you've currently uh, got, a, got in your business. Because I, I can remember when I worked in larger industry, when things became too onerous to do, too complex, working as a tradesperson, a lot of people would would neglect to do uh, or fill out the necessary forms, policies or the procedures, whatever was in, in the system, people would do that after the job had been completed. So if you can make things as simple as what you can so people want to use them, uh, that will make uh, your workplace health and safety management system work a little bit better. Um, I've just lost the screen, Stephanie. I've got it back. Nobody panic. So with uh, with the Act, it actually says, uh, without limiting subsections one and two, a person conducting a business or undertaking must ensure, so far as reasonably practicable. So those su subsections one and two basically mean that you need to ensure that you um, uh, 
make sure that people who are involved in your workplace are able to work safely or the health and safety of those that you employ and also whatever you carry out doesn't affect the health and safety of other people. But a bit further down in the Act it actually discusses then some uh, information about some other duty and one of the other duties are the provision and maintenance of a safe system of work. So a safe system of work can mean a workplace health and safety management system. That tends to be the format that most people use today to be able to uh, manage their workplace health and safety management or man manage their workplace health and safety. So we need to work out now what actually is contained in a workplace health and safety management system. So what does it contain? Well the first thing that it contains is a policy. So this is why you're actually going to do the activity or the, the um, or implement the, the procedure, why you're actually going to do that. Then you'll have a procedure and the procedure is actually how you're going to carry out that particular activity, that, that particular part of your workplace health and safety ma management system. And then the last part of a, a workplace health and safety management system would be a method for recording information. So those are the three components of a workplace health and safety management system. And to be able to uh, ensure that you have all those things in place sometimes can be a bit onerous and a bit difficult, especially if you're in a small business because you think this is such a huge thing to carry out. But it's not as difficult as what you might think. But I'm just going to... Uh, digress a, a little bit, we're going to talk about one particular policy that I think is really important in our businesses and this is an induction policy. And the reason why I think that's important is that um, if we don't induct our workers to the workplace, how can they understand what, their expecta what your expectations may be as an employer? So under the workplace health and safety legislation, you're either an officer or a worker. Now if you're an officer, what you need to realise is that as an officer within a business, so if you own a business, if you're a sole trader or if you're in a partnership, more than likely you're an officer and the reason why is that they've, um, they've actually they've actually developed a, a couple of things from the Corporations Act and a person who makes or participates in making decisions that affect the whole or a substantial part of the business or the corporation is someone who was identified as an officer or it could be those who have the capacity to affect significantly the corporation's financial standing. Now this differs slightly from the previous act where somebody was appointed as the, uh, the officer in the organisation. So you could be an officer in your organisation, you, you may be, as it says here, just a worker. So what's the responsibilities of a worker? Well as a worker, what you need to do is realise that you've got to take care of your own um, health and safety. So that hasn't changed anything much from the previous Act and make sure that whatever you do doesn't affect the health and safety of other people around you. So that's pretty much the same as what the previous Act uh, indicated and then they need to comply as far as reasonably able with any reasonable instruction given by the person conducting the business or undertaking to allow them to comply with the Act and also cooperate with any reasonable policy or procedure that's put in place. So these last two dot points are, are new and it makes it very clear that the uh, a worker has a responsibility to comply to whatever you put in place to manage your workplace health and safety. So I just made up a little slide here to, to indicate how this might look. So I just need to go back. Just bear with me a moment. Okay. So this little slide here actually demonstrates that the PCBU is the entity or the business and within the PCBU 
there's going to be some officers who are responsible for ensuring that the PCBU complies. So the PCBU has a duty to workers and others and the officers need to ensure that they perform due diligence to ensure that the PCBU complies. Now underneath that you might have managers, you might have supervisors, you may have workers. So their responsibilities might be as a manager, it might be advise, develop and implement uh, workplace health and safety um, policy and procedure. The supervisors need to implement and enforce whatever is designed to manage workplace health and safety. And generally the workers need to obey and cooperate. So under the Workplace Health and Safety Act, if you're a manager, a supervisor or a worker, you're classed as workers. And that's why it's really important to have a, an induction because if you don't have an induction, how does anyone know what role they have in the business? Sometimes managers might be uh, included in as, a, as an officer just depending on the, on the uh, uh, complexity of their role and how much they actually have control over the, the business but it needs to go back to the Corporations Act to, act to, to define whether they are officers or not. But generally they're classed as workers and what they have is a responsibility to uh, ensure that they manage workplace health and safety as a worker because there's consequences whether you're an officer or whether you're a worker under the Workplace Health and Safety Act. Now we're just going to look specifically at policy and what a policy might contain and how you might be able to set up and, and understand how to, to set it out in a document format. So in general a, uh, a policy is formulated by an organisation to define or or help them understand what the rules or guidelines are to make sure that it's able to reach its long-term goal. So that's just the, a dictionary definition of what a policy is. But for as far as workplace health and safety is concerned, it demonstrates your commitment to workplace health and safety in general because your, your workplace should have a workplace health and safety policy, an overarching policy, but it, then there will be policies that are specific to particular areas of the of activities that you undertake. So they're the two components of a workplace health and safety um, policy. Now how does it look? So what it might have, it needs to be simple to read so all levels of the workforce can understand it because as uh, time has gone by we know that we're getting uh, people who might not be uh, originally from Australia, they might have uh, arrived in Australia as, as uh, refugees or immigrants and their English may not be as, as, uh, as competent as what we would have expected. As we, we know the school system sometimes uh, allows people to get through without being as, as, as good, a, uh, good at understanding or comprehending the written word. So we need to make sure that the policy is simple so everyone can have an opportunity to read it. So we need to use plain English and make it very clear what people can do. So we're just going to just have a look at a web page here possibly, no we're not. We'll just go back to the policy and what it might contain. So in the policy we need to figure out what's the purpose, why do we need that policy. The next step is a commencement date when you're actually going to implement this policy in your workplace. The next step would be the scope, who it actually applies to and the next part would be the body of the document. So that's just generally what the policy is all about. And then you might have an acknowledgement, not all policies need an acknowledgement that someone has read it but you need in some in particular like um, perhaps uh, bullying and harassment, it might be uh, drug and alcohol policies, those sort of policies generally need an acknowledgement to, to, to help you understand that whoever has read that document has acknowledged it and understood what the content is. So how, how might that look? What, what might that look like when we uh, actually uh, see it in the uh, written form? So this is just a, a really basic site induction policy for a business. So as you read through it, it just says to introduce new employees and site visitors to the workplace. So that's why you have the policy. 
the next part describes any person entering the work site who will need to will need to undergo a site induction before entering the site. So basically, that's the when and the who. And the last part is the body of the document, and it actually tells you how you're going to go about it. So that's a very simple site induction policy, just for a sole trade or a small business. You might prepare one like that in your own workplace. The other way that it might appear is just something like this, with a couple of headings through the document. So it just depends on on what how you feel, what you feel might be easier for your employees or your, your the people that work for you to read. So that's what a policy might look like, a site induction or an induction policy for a small business. So the next part we're going to look at is a procedure. So as the uh, slide indicates, a procedure are the, method, the specific methods employed to express policies and actions in the day-to-day -day operations of the organisation. So basically what we need to work out is what has to be done, how it has to be done, who has to do it and when it has to be done. So once again it's really important if you want your employees to actually look at this document, the same as the policy, you need to use simple words. You might be able to use photos in the uh, procedure clear photos just concisely conveying what the activity is and how you would like it done. You might be able to use diagrams, very simple flow charts might be used. Sometimes we see flow charts with lots of arrows and different, uh, different forms of, uh, of explanation throughout and they become really confusing. People will not read something that's confusing, you need to keep it as, as simple as what you can. So the next thing we'll look at is just a basic procedure relating to the uh, policy that we just looked at. And so we looked at an induction policy, now we're just going to look at a basic induction procedure. So as you can see on the screen there, it's uh, you know, Hobart Electric requires all old and new employees to undertake an induction. And then it talks about a generic induction, a site specific induction, and if the site specific induction can it be arranged on site, the induction will be emailed to the employee them, and then back to the PCBU and the induction needs to be signed and returned by email to Hobart Electric. So very clear words there. So you can see this is what has to be done. The next part says who does it, how it's to be done and finally when it's to be done before entering the worksite. So you can see the procedure is very simple not too complex and doesn't take much to read so people will obviously look at it. Well that's the plan. And uh, the next step is uh, just a simple flow chart on how that occurs because sometimes people like to look at pictures rather than read text. So very little text on this one, step one, step two, step three. They can read that in a few seconds. If you put too much text in people won't bother reading it. So that's just uh, makes it a little bit simpler to understand and it conveys the information that was in the previous slide quite clearly. Now, recording information. So this is the information that we use to actually prove that we've done what we said we're going to do through our policy and procedure. So it gives you a record of the information that might be discussed or the information that, that might be conveyed in your policy or procedure. And if an investigation is needed, it's proof of an event happening. So if things go pear shape, um, an inspector comes along, you can show some very clear and concise documentation that proves that you've done what you said you're going to do. And finally, it might help you identify flaws in the system. And as you go through using your recording information, you might see that people are not filling it out or whatever might be going on. They might be reading the uh, procedure properly, whatever it is, it gives you a starting point to have a look at uh, what we might be able to do to change that and review the system. So we've looked at a policy for a site induction, we've looked at a procedure. So the next part we're going to look at is this is just a basic document that I prepared to go through to discuss with the employee when they come on site. So there's a few dot points there that you would go through and discuss with your your employee during the site induction and that would differ from business to business. 
but those points just need to be discussed so the employee knows clearly what their your obligation or what their obligations are as far as workplace health and safety goes for your business. And another thing I meant to mention it before when we were discussing the the induction. Induction gives you an opportunity to talk about you know whether what the wage structure is, your expectations on the quality of work that you want from your employee, the hours of work, and also what your expectations are as far as workplace health and safety goes. So if you address those issues right at the start of your, your employment or you're employing someone, you very very clearly stamp your requirements, your standard of behaviour, whatever it might be, on your expectations on the new employee. So if you're able to do that, you're then able to go, if there's something wrong, they're not adhering to the policy or procedure you put in place to cover workplace health and safety, the standard of work is not up to where it should be, you can actually go and discuss that with them because you'd actually talked about it to them in your induction. So this is a little document that I developed to, to deal specifically with the workplace health and safety things that you'd like to go through. And the next document is just a basic uh, tick box where you've actually indicated that you've discussed these points with your employee and then at the bottom of the document it actually shows whether they can sign it and acknowledge that they've read that you've discussed those points with it and dated as well. Now I'm not sure if that appears on your screen appearing on mine but hopefully it is on theirs on yours. Now what are some essential policies and procedures you might need for a business? So as I mentioned for before, the first thing that you need is an overarching workplace health and safety document and you may have seen these as you walk into some workplaces and it generally talks about what management responsibilities are as far as workplace health and safety is concerned, what the obligations of a worker is in that particular business as far as workplace health and safety is concerned and then it would be signed by an officer within the organisation to indicate its currency. So that's just the overarching workplace health and safety policy. Then mentioned induction is probably the next most important uh, policy and procedure that you should uh, put in place because uh, if you don't induct your employees, how do they know what they're supposed to do? How do they know what your, your requirements are as far as workplace health and safety goes? The next uh, policy or procedure, policy and procedure you need is a safe system of work. So that will vary from business to business. Um, this is the, the way that you actually manage the workplace as far as workplace health and safety goes. So we've seen uh, many campaigns in the past like spot the hazard, assess the risk, put a control measure in place, those types of things. So it might be as simple as just a safe operating procedure, it could be something like a take five which is a very basic hazard identification or risk assessment and if you work in uh, uh, industries that have high risk you might then have to do a thing called a, a job safety analysis, a JSA, a safe work method statement if you're in the construction industry, very similar type doc documents, JSAs, um, safe work method statements and lots of industries call them different names, they, they can be JSEA, but they're basically the same thing, just a more complex hazard identification and risk assessment document. You need a safety communication policy and procedure, how you actually include consultation within your workplace for your employees and how they're actually have, able to have input into how you manage workplace health and safety and how you communicate that back to them. Uh, you need an incident management policy and procedure, one that indicates how if someone is injured or hurt or there's a near miss, how you record that, how you actually deal with the situation that occurred, what, um, what control measures you, you've put in place to try and address, so, to address that situation so it doesn't occur again. And you need an emergency procedure. So if things really turn bad, how are you going to get out of the building, out of the, off the work site, where are you going to go to, those sorts of things. So these few policies are ones that all businesses should have in their workplace health and safety management system. Now some other policies you might need to consider is drug and alcohol policies. This has just became, become mandatory I think in the construction industry that they're going to implement that very shortly. But in other industries if you're involved with people that uh, may be driving vehicles, 
you know, if they have a few drinks Sunday night, come to work and have to drive a delivery truck, is it relevant that you may have to implement a drug and alcohol policy and procedure? If someone was driving your truck around with too much alcohol in their system, they crashed into someone, I think that you'd probably have to demonstrate that how you were managing drug and alcohol in your workplace. You might have, you would have a policy and procedure on plant and equipment that you use. You might have uh, isolation procedures if you were doing maintenance type work in your uh, in the in the business that you've got. You might, if you work in an area where you might be confronted with asbestos, you'd need a policy and procedure how you're going to deal with that. If you employ contractors, you need to make sure that you have a policy and procedure on how you're going to deal with contractors who work for you because if you have a subcontractor, you need to ensure that they have a workplace health and safety management system in place. A few more might be a testing and tagging policy annual handling, working at heights, safety signage, confined space. So it just depends on what business you're in and what activities you undertake in your business as to what policy and procedures that you may need. Now, before you, um, before we, uh, you started this, uh, this particular webinar, I think uh, Stephanie sent out to you a book with the Safety Management Toolkit. If you get a chance to look at that, you'll see a series of documents that are things like uh, workplace health and safety, uh, rather a overarching workplace health and safety policy and a series of policy documents that you can use in your own workplace. Those particular documents are available in Word format on the WorkSafe TAS website or you can get a CD by contacting either um, WorkSafe TAS or the TCCI and they can send you out a CD with the word format of those particular documents. So things like uh, that we've just looked at, the policies that we just looked at, there's a, a number of documents in that particular toolkit that would help you address those particular areas of concern. I forgot the PPE policy. Now what do you need to do? Well, if if you don't have a workplace health and safety management system, you need to get one because under the workplace health and safety legislation, you're required, it doesn't matter whether you're a sole trader, a small business, a partnership, a multinational company, you need a workplace health and safety management system or have something in place to manage workplace health and safety under the Act. If you already have a system, Maybe it's time that you might consider having a review of your system. A lot of places that I visit as a workplace health and safety advisor, they've got systems that they've had in place for a number of years, being something that they've uh, developed prior to the new legislation coming in place in 2013. So if you have a system, you should review it. And if you haven't reviewed it in the last two years, you should review it anyway. Now, if you're unsure how to, there's workplace health and safety advisors available through two avenues. You can call the TCC on 62363600, which is independent information on workplace health and safety um, that you can access. It's a free service to all business and industry. And there's uh, advisors in the south and in the north of the state that will be happy to come along to your business and guide you through developing your own workplace health and safety management system. Also WorkSafe TAS provides the same service and you can contact them on 1300 366 322 and that would that you'd be able to access a workplace health and safety uh, advisor through the same means. So whether you want independent advice or come direct to uh, WorkSafe TAS, you, you can make that call. But as I mentioned, it's a free service that's available to all business and industry. So that's about the end of my part. So if you've got any questions, I'm quite happy to answer them. Yes, thank, thank you very much for that, um, for that, Craig, and for covering the basic requirements of a, of a WHS management system. As Craig mentioned, we've still got some time. If anyone does have any questions, um, please do type your questions through in the panel on the, um, on the right-hand side. Uh, but just to run through, there are other WorkSafe Month uh, webinars obviously running over the next uh, four weeks, so please do head to the WorkSafe uh, TAS website. Have 
have a look at what else we're running and um, and do sort of uh, register to uh, to hook into um, to any other webinars or venue sessions or live feeds that we do have coming up. And it appears that you did cover the basic <laughs> basics, Craig, um, because we, we currently don't. Oh, actually. I take that back. <laughs> uh, question that's come, actually, no, no, no questions, but uh, as I just said, a uh, good presentation. Um, no, good comments all around. <laughs> so yes, so thank you very much, Craig, for um, again covering the, the basics of a WHS management system. As uh, mentioned, we will be, um, we have recorded uh, this webinar um, and we'll be making uh, the recording and the slides available on the WorkSafe TAS site after WorkSafe month. Um, and do uh, please stay on your computer uh, to complete the, uh, the feedback survey that's, um, that's coming up. Um, and uh, for any any documents that that we have, we'll certainly make sure that um, we we get them to any anyone who has hooked into uh, today's webinar. So thank you very much for your time, and on behalf of uh, WorkSafe Tasmania and our presenter today, Craig Hortle from the Tasmanian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, thank you for uh, for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.